Hello, and welcome to Headwise, the video cast and podcast of the National Headache Foundation. I'm Dr. Lindsay Weitzel. I'm the founder of Migraine Nation, and I have a history of chronic and daily migraine that began at the age of four. Today is our headache news episode with Dr. Tim Smith. Hi, Dr. Smith. How are you today? Doing very well. Thanks for having me on. Well, thanks for being here. Sure. Dr. Smith is a regular on our show because of his extensive experience in migraine clinical trials as the CEO of Study Metrics Research. Dr. Smith is also a board member of the National Headache Foundation and a headache specialist. We're extra excited whenever he is on and he knows so much. So let's see what we can learn about today. We have a few newly published studies to discuss and we even have a couple of new medications that have been approved by the FDA that I'm really excited to, to chat about. So let's dive right into the new medicines. Let's start with the one that's for migraine. There is a new migraine medication approval. It is not yet available in the pharmacy. We're gonna have to wait another four months or so, but it's been approved by the FDA and it's from a company called Axum. So can you talk to us about that, Dr. Smith? Uh, sure. This is, it's exciting to have a new FDA approval for acute treatment of migraine. And this brand name of this drug is called Simbravo. Mm -hmm. And it's actually, we're referring to it as a new drug. It's actually a combination of two drugs that we've had for quite a while. And those two drugs are Rizotriptan, which we know is the brand name of Maxalt. And mm -hmm. uh, it's been around for a long time. And many of our viewers undoubtedly may use Rizotriptan or drugs like it. And then the other component is something called meloxicam, which is a prescription anti-inflammatory medication. Mm -hmm. And so what this Exome group has done is combined the two ingredients together in a single tablet. And the, the meloxicam is marketed for treatment of arthritis or inflammatory conditions, and people take it basically once a day. And so it's got this long half-life and it kind of has the onset and duration that you would want from an arthritis medicine. But we know that these ibuprofen, super ibuprofen-like medications can be good for migraine pain as well. And, mm -hmm. and this company put together uh, Meloxicam. It's a little higher dose than what you can get on the, the original brand name that's out there, but it's 20 milligrams of Meloxicam and 10 milligrams of rizotriptan, which is the standard dose that's in the Maxalt marketed tablets. Uh, the unique thing that they did is they formulated this tablet so that the meloxicam portion is released quickly. And mm -hmm. instead of having a half time to maximum onset of uh, three hours, it, it gets to maximum onset in, in less than an hour. So that combined with the rizotriptan, which kicks in in less than an hour, gives you sort of that two mechanisms it's kind of like what they did with Treximet. You may remember some years back with mm -hmm. Sumatriptan and uh, Naproxen. And so this is kind of a follow-on to that, uh, but trying to get the longer duration with Meloxicam and get that more rapid uh, onset with the special formulation. But they're, they've performed well in their clinical trials. About 20% of people were pain-free at two hours compared to less than 7% on the placebo arm. And the researchers did a good job of trying to minimize that placebo response in the study. And mm -hmm. they, interestingly, they did a second study where they treated the patients when the headache was mild mm -hmm. and their percent response. So earlier. Yeah. For just a, a level one headache out of a one, two, three scale, mm -hmm. the pain freedom rate was 30, almost 33% uh, compared to 16% on the placebo arm. So these were significant. The FDA reviewed it. They've had a, a long and kind of rocky road getting this thing to the market. They started out in the in the pandemic, you know, mm -hmm. debacle, and their studies were stymied, and they had a lot of delays in that. And then the FDA had them do a lot of additional statistical analysis and different ways to report, and it's taken a while, but they finally got in their the FDA yes. approval, and I think... Um, um, We'll have a lot of our folks that will want to try that. So we only have about four more months to wait, and it is some Bravo is what it's called. So be on the lookout for that. And as Dr. Smith said, we actually did report on that for the first time quite some time ago. We've been waiting a while for this medicine, and there are some people that are pretty excited. Um, so we're going to move on to our next FDA approval, which is not specifically for migraine. In fact, it's for acute pain. It's a non-opioid that is a painkiller, but we do have a lot of people in our audience who we get a lot of procedures, et cetera. So we are going to talk about this medicine and it could be relevant to us. It's called, I hope I'm saying it right, Dr. Smith. It's called Jernovix. 
<laughs> Why don't you talk to us about that? Yeah, I think it's Jernovix. That's what it looks like. But this is what they call a, a gated sodium channel blocker. And these are these sodium channels are on peripheral nerves and in the relay stations and the spinal cord that mm -hmm. uh, send pain signals to the brain. And they're basically the open the pore and and the the signal is transmitted. And so if you block it, you can block a pain signal. And that's what the researchers were able to show in these acute pain models. I think you pointed out this is a non-opioid and this is the first non-opioid acute pain treatment we've had in mm -hmm. my career, basically. And they these the medicines work peripherally, so they don't have central nervous system side effects to speak of. Uh, this this class of drugs, I think it will be this is the first one. There could be others in the development pathways, but they study these acutely post-operative patients. So you have a surgery for, in the studies they did was abdominoplasty, kind of tummy tuck procedures, and then bunionectomy. It's a foot surgery to remove bunions. Right. And these are painful surgeries and the patients require analgesics, opioids in the post-op stage. Mm -hmm. And they substituted Jernavix for the opioids. And basically the studies, uh, to cut to the chase, they showed similar results between the opioids and the uh, Jernavix. That's encouraging because we are trying to steer clear of opioids for obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. Diversion, abuse, misuse, and overdoses, those kinds of things are a problem with opioids and and we know for our migraine patients, they're a problem with inducing this uh, opioid-induced hyperalgesia. Mm -hmm. Presumably, these sodium channel blockers won't have those kinds of issues and uh, rebound and uh, or medication overuse problems. So okay. it's, it's not specifically for migraine. They study this differently than we do migraine. They use different endpoints. But I could see patients who frequently have to rescue with analgesics. You know, this might be something that would be a, a preferable substitute for some of the opioid medicines that some people have to use for for rescue out there or, or sometimes do. I was going to ask, what's the next step? Is there a reason that it's not indicated for chronic pain or specifically for headache yet? Or do you think that they'll start testing it in yeah. these populations or using it in these populations? Yeah, the, they, the company is already sponsoring chronic pain studies. So for like diabetic neuropathy or other chronic daily pain uh, issues, and those results are still pending. The studies are ongoing, but they did get their approval for acute pain. I'm not aware of any migraine work going on anywhere. Perhaps they will study a migraine population or sponsor a study that uh, some of our research friends could uh, could perform. I think that would be a great, a great project to pull off. Or any of our other headache disorders, NDPH or, or anything. Yeah, it absolutely. sounds like it would be interesting to know if it helps anyone in our community. So our next study is a meta-analysis that was published this month, and it's on a medication that's normally prescribed to lower cholesterol, but it is thought that it may actually help improve migraine, which I find super interesting. What do you think of this work, and why might this be true? Yeah, this is kind of a pooled analysis from some researchers that pulled together some observational data to look at this association. But we've known about or thought about this migraine preventive effect that apparently uh, statin drugs may have still needs to be studied, but there looks to be like there's a connection. The authors of this paper point out that the statins are what the we used to call them HMG-CoA reductase inhibitors, and now we call mm -hmm. them statins, I think, for obvious reasons. Uh, uh -huh. That's a mouthful, but <laughs> HMG-CoA reductase is the enzyme that's produced uh, that is responsible for creation of LDL, bad cholesterol, we call it. And the association between overexpression of this gene and increased headache has been described before. And then there have been some small observational studies that have looked at association of migraine with the statin drugs. And it uh, basically, to cut to the chase, it, uh, patients who are treated with statins tend to have a reduction in their headaches. And in their analysis, when they pulled this information together, it was about a three-day reduction in monthly migraine burden just from these small studies. Mm -hmm. And the other interesting thing is that it appeared to be extra effective in patients who had higher higher vitamin D levels. Okay. So we were aware of a company that was trying to design a study a few years ago to look at the combination of statin drug with vitamin D as a supplementation as migraine headache preventive. But we never got to do that study. I don't know where it is, if they're seeking funding or whatever, but uh, hopefully we'll get more information on that. But it's sort of interesting. And I guess 
from my perspective, this doesn't give us reason to go out and start putting everyone on, on statin drugs. But right. if, if especially your general practice uh, prescribers, internal medicine, uh, family medicine, uh, generalists who may be looking at a patient's overall health care, if there's an opportunity for kind of a, what we call a therapeutic twofer, mm -hmm. someone's cholesterol is high or even borderline high, and mm -hmm. you and they have migraine, it certainly makes sense to me to try to get a statin on board and count some headache days and see if it's worth right. pursuing. I guess I, what I'm curious about, and I bet some people are wondering is, do we know if there's any obvious risk factors to taking a statin if you don't have high cholesterol? Right. And because I, I could imagine someone who's, well, my cholesterol is not high. Could I take mm -hmm. this anyway and let, for the headache benefit potentially? And we don't know of, of the potential downside from taking a statin drug in the face of normal cholesterol. We know that some people who have heart attack and stroke and have normal cholesterol, they put them on statins anyway because the statin drugs have what we call endo, endothelial stabilizing effects. And that mm -hmm. means the inside lining of the blood vessels are stabilized, so they're less likely to have another stroke or heart attack. Some people take that another step and say that may be related to why there might be a migraine prevention effect, but we don't know that for sure. Right. But it's an interesting association. There used to be a presumption that uh, extremely low cholesterols were, were associated with cancer, but that came from patients who had cancer and had low cholesterol. But it turns out those people are really sick and been on chemotherapy and their cholesterols run low because of their cancer and their treatments. Mm -hmm. And so it's not a cause and effect relationship. This would be something that individuals would need to talk with their doctor about whether or not it would be worthwhile. You know, say, I've got a strong family history of stroke and, you know, right. my pressure runs a little bit high, but I don't have high cholesterol, but I do have these migraines. Would it be right. reasonable? So you could think of okay. scenarios where it might be considered. Okay. So I, I love this study. This is another surprising study. It looked at the use of proton pump inhibitors and migraine. And the reason this is interesting to me is I feel like we're always hearing about something negative related to proton pump inhibitors. And so many yeah. people with migraine take them, whether it's because we took indomethacin or some other NSAID and we got ulcers or, or something wrong with our stomach. So it is interesting. So I always, I really wanted to report on this. So what do you, what do you think of their findings that might increase migraine? Now, if you go and look at the package labels for Protonics and uh, uh, Prilosec and some of these, uh, the, right. the Omeprazole and, and other like molecules that are very, very common, you can get uh, Prilosec uh, without a prescription and I think Nexium too these days or, mm -hmm. or some brand of that. Uh, so they're, they're felt to be highly safe and very, very effective in preventing stomach ulcers or treating stomach ulcers or preventing acid reflux, where they're commonly used a lot or, or uh, treating the symptoms of that. But if you go back and look at the original clinical trials on several of these proton pump inhibitors, the number one side effect in the clinical trials was headache. It occurred at something as, as often as 12% of the patients. And we think of with more modern medicines, if they have side effects occurring more than say two to 5% of the time, that's considered a lot. And as many as six to 12% uh, patients on proton pump inhibitors had headaches. Uh, and these were in clinical trials for stomach acid reduction. So patients just report what they have. So um, that's not to say that these people were met the IHS criteria for migraine, you know, the things that we say in clinical studies, right. but they did have significant headache and it was during mm -hmm. proton pump inhibitor use and did not occur to that extent in the placebo arms of those studies. So this is something we've been aware of for a while. We still don't understand exactly why, but what uh, these folks did is they did a, a PubMed review and they wound up doing a narrative review, looking at the few studies that have looked at this. Basically, the headache clinical trials have not been done uh, to look at the association, but we do know there are people who metabolize the proton pump inhibitors very quickly, rapid metabolizers, we call mm -hmm. them. And then there are people that are slow metabolizers. And when you looked at in studies that were looking at the differences between those two, the patients who were the slow metabolizers and accumulated more of the drug in their bloodstream had a lot more headache days than the people who were the fast metabolizers. So that kind of is sort of more supportive information just besides the placebo controls of adverse events and the clinical trials for the drugs. 
some have suggested that there may be a CGRP role in this, but the evidence is not great for that. So I don't, I don't want to get in that situation. You know, what we know we look for and what we look for we find. I don't want to yeah. you know, uh, do, get into that business. But, but it, it's clear that uh, proton pump inhibitors may be associated with increased headache. I think for our viewership, those of you that are taking proton pump inhibitors out there, I, I would suggest you talk to your doctors. I don't, I don't want you to just discontinue a drug right. because of this. Uh, you know, they, if you wind up having bleeding ulcers or something as a result right. of discontinuing it unwisely, that wouldn't be good. The take-home message is be careful with this. In my career, I have had patients who've had refractory headaches that uh, if they were on proton pump inhibitors, I would have them stop, at least if it was medically feasible to do so, and have them stop and see what happens to their headache days. And more than once, we saw some people get some reduction in their in their migraines. So this is kind of some more supportive data to really confirm that it's not just a, a, a casual observation, that this is really an association that we need to pay attention to. And hopefully we'll have some more research work done on it down the line. Okay. I think the last study we're going to talk about today, it's interesting because it found relationship between chronic migraine and pelvic pain in women. So why might that be? Well, I think the, the general way of thinking of this is that our patients with chronic migraine, we know that they have a fair amount of central nervous system sensitization. So these higher pain centers get switched on mm -hmm. and it just makes pain sensitivity go up. And uh, so we know that's a characteristic of chronic migraine. And we know that there's that's a shared feature with other comorbid pain disorders, such as fibromyalgia and irritable bowel syndrome. It's also comorbid with mood disorders and things like that, sleep disturbances. But I think what we're pointing out on this is that pelvic pain or pelvic floor pain, pelvic myalgias, dyspareunia, which is a fancy word for saying pain on intercourse. Mm -hmm. um, and they also included things like this uh, chronic cystitis uh, issues that some women have is associated with pelvic pain. And it's just this heightened pain sensitivity occurs at about two and a half times the rate of people who don't have migraines. So this is mm -hmm. sort of confirmation of, of information that we already know. And this was some research that was done out of Stanford, and they were looking at some large databases and saw this clear association with <clears throat> with chronic pelvic pain and dyspareunia with people with migraine. I think it's important to, to highlight this study today because we commonly think of in our female patients who have migraine, we, we always talk about fibromyalgia, we talk about irritable bowel and mood disorders and sleep disturbances, but I think painful intercourse or pelvic pain is not mm. something that you would necessarily go in and talk to your neurologist about or... Right. Maybe right. even your general physician, you might put that together. And I think this may be occurring at a much more higher rate than we think uh, because claims databases are not going to be coded for these, mm -hmm. these other pain syndromes very much. And we just want to highlight, you know, the fact that these two pain disorders do occur together and there may be some some common ways of treating as well. And, and it should be part of the conversation and, and managing migraine as well. All right. Well, that is super interesting. And I think it's important that everyone understands why, because I think sometimes when we are starting to accumulate multiple pain syndromes, multiple things that are wrong, sometimes we don't want to talk to the doctor about all of them because we feel like whiners. Yeah. But the fact is that that sort of is characteristic of being someone with chronic migraine um, because our nervous systems are just so heightened and the central sensitization that you spoke of. So I was pretty excited to report on that study. I think people will find it interesting. So that is it for today. We will be back soon with another news episode. We try to do these as often as possible. So thank you so much for being here with us today, Dr. Smith. Thank you everyone for joining us on this episode of Headwise News. Bye-bye.